Disruptors and curious minds, welcome to another episode of Thinking on Paper. This is a we're tailing towards the end of the year. We are uh, looking back at a great experiment, and we are shifting our uh, our positioning a little bit. Not our positioning, but our plan today. But we are really excited to to shift this plan. My name is Jeremy Gilbertson. I love uh, poking around at emerging tech and trying to connect it with culture to make really cool things happen with me is uh mark fielding mark is a brilliant writer lore developer uh he actually wrote a book called apocalypse daddy uh if you guys haven't heard that uh yet but mark <laughs> which they are... probably haven't well they have now mark what's <laughs> happening today bud hey 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 jeremy yeah I'm, I'm very well yeah um i'm all those things and very uh, quite emotional today this our, our last guest of the first season we may or may not do a show next week kind of like going over all our guests 50 odd guests this year but i'm it's emotional i'm i'm really i'm, re I'm really proud of what we've done to get here like literally every week for the last year we've had a, an awesome guest we've had some amazing conversations so to get here yeah very emotional very proud of that and for me it's been another week of yeah writing. I've been down the the um, the quantum computing rabbit hole again this week. You'll like to know. So um, I'm writing a piece on that and how quantum. You know, there's like a quantum computer that's actually commercially available now. So you know, things are happening. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. Um, but before, like, I was actually having a I was supposed to have a meeting with a quantum computer a couple of hours ago. For whatever reason, we couldn't do that. So I fell into Twitter and. There was a, and maybe our guest Liz can tell us about this, but there was a big ledger exploit. And literally, on I don't know if you saw this because you've probably been in bed, but every they, they're all everyone's saying don't go on any single Web3 dap at the moment because there's a, a ledger loop um, exploit that is just draining wallets on dapps. Oh my so gosh. If wow. anyone's watching this live, don't go on any dapps unless it's been cleared up by now. But, um, it was the big breaking news this morning. Wow. Wow. Well, before we get into our conversation with our interdisciplinary guest today, um, I want to talk about a couple quick things you see on the scroll down below. Uh, we've started a book club. There's nearly 50 people that are participating in this book club. Uh, we are growing it day by day, minute by minute, and we are increasing the interactivity of this book club. So right now, if you sign up on thinking uh, thinking on paper.xyz slash book club, put your email address in there. We'll send you weekly breakdowns of The Nexus by uh, one of our previous guests, uh, Julio Latino, wonderful book. Uh, we're having great fun doing that, but actually we're going to start bringing people together in real time for our next book to be announced Exciting. probably next week. Yeah, before Christmas. Before Christmas, um, lastly, we we don't want to uh, forget our wonderful sponsor, Ripple, W-R-I-P-P-L-E, -E, Marketing's on-demand talent platform. These guys have been amazing supporters of the show, and they're doing really cool things on their own to stack interdisciplinary teams and lead them and manage them for brands like uh, like Delta, like Equifax, like uh, AT&T. A lot of big companies rely on them. There's over 3,000 vetted solopreneur specialists ps mark and i are on the roster as well um so thanks to uh ray dixie and the ripple team without further ado mark let's get into it let's get our guest on why don't you give us a great introduction like you always do <laughs> thank you um so yeah a lot of our, our shows of late have been about technical aspects about brands and have been a bit more business orientated and i thought it'd be good to end the season with a with a, an, an artist an abstract artist i think a lot of our listeners and fans came into web3 via nfts via pfps via digital art that's where the first kind of sort of second i don't know third fourth wave of people came in so today's guest um louise donahue is a an abstract artist a digital artist she's a teacher she's a rebel she's a, an fractional cmo strategist consultant um and has something on her Twitter about living provenance, digital, conceptual NFTs, which I'd like to dig into at some point as well. So, yeah, welcome. Luz. Hello. Hi. Hi. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon for me. Good morning. For Good morning for me. Yeah, we got them both. Time is a construct. <laughs> yeah, we invented it, didn't it. we? We invented it. Like, yeah, let's let's get into presence, though. So tell us tell us a little bit about yourself. Just give us give us a, a, a little cast of a journey 
that way we can uh, dive into all these different great aspects that you're involved in with, with painting, with teaching art, you know, helping people figure out messaging and strategy and all of that. So uh, yeah, tell us about yourself. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll start backwards and just say that um, I have finally come to terms with the fact that these two practices are actually the same thing, um, which has been a really fun journey of just interacting with the strategy tech futurism side of me through the artist perspective and kind of melding those things. Um, I am a very autodidactic, random misfit person, started in social media management early 2010. That led to consulting, which led to strategy. And then um, pretty early on around 2014, it was introduced to blockchain technology as a concept on a road trip on a podcast. And then as a joke, somebody gave me a Bitcoin in 2015 and here so I am. I, I, I hold Bitcoin in 2019. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I lost it. Oh. We can get into that later. But that was um, in the paper wallet days, you know, so I had like this paper stuck in a book that I hope will change somebody's life one day. I'm sure at a thrift store somewhere near you. <laughs> Oh it's lucky, the, the, perhaps lucky that they only gave you one and not a hundred. And <laughs> that Can you imagine? Quite, that'd be quite an emotional um, thing to deal with. Well, well, Luz, here's here's what I, I tend to think about too, because I, I live in different worlds and and you know do different things in in I guess different domains is probably the the, the right way to say it. But like like yourself, it, it took me until recently to actually stand back and go, wait a minute. I'm doing the same kind of thing with just different inputs and different outputs. Like the process is, is the same. And I think a lot of people, especially our listeners, um, probably have struggled with that because it's a very uh, single threaded world related to employment, related to finding a job and all of that. Yeah. How, how did you, how did you balance all of that? And you know, what, what has happened since you've been able to kind of coalesce the vision? Yeah. I mean, that's whew, big question. So, what I realized over time is that the more that I study creativity and I start to really try to understand how things get made, the more that I understand that there really isn't any difference in how you make one thing to how you make everything. And then kind of extrapolating from there, I end up in conversations with clients or conversations with even just colleagues and start to see these connections that I can't unsee. The way I got here is I, I've been teaching this process that I created uh, around 2016, very long story, but essentially I was injured and I was doing portraits, I was doing marketing consultant and <laughs> pet portraits on the side. And um, I did so many over one holiday season that I actually ended up like getting a pretty severe injury in my arm. So I had to develop a way where I could paint without necessarily getting too repetitive in my motions. And this is how the painting process was born. And then over time, people started asking about it and I started to teach these workshops. In the workshops, I would get these people who would come in. Sometimes it was like date night. It was like, um, you know, you could tell somebody had been like, brought in by their partner and they were kind of apprehensive. People would say things like, oh, I'm not creative. Oh, I, I don't really do that, but somebody wanted me to come. And usually it would be somebody with a fairly analytical job. So like an accountant, maybe even a programmer sometimes. And once they would go through this process, they would come out at the other side and say, oh, I didn't know that I could do that, or I didn't know that it could be easy, or I didn't know that I already had some of these uh, ways of thinking. And ultimately, what I'm teaching in this workshop is navigating analytical thinking and kind of flow state, the creative process, not from a place of there's an inner critic that's like telling you what's wrong with you, but more like, maybe there's different levers and one lever is trying to analyze and break down and the other le le lever is trying to create something new and we can't push on both the gas and the brake at the same time and have good results. 
That is the exact same process that I see happening within agencies when we're trying to develop concepts for, concepts for clients, when we're trying to figure out a new way to talk about something new, when we're trying to educate people. And so uh, to me, that's kind of the, the line that holds both things is the intentionality behind an analytical moment and the role of the analyst within us and then a creative and expansive moment and the role of that artist within us. Holy smokes. Like yeah, this, 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 smokes. This, <laughs> this, this stuff is so aligned with, with what I do and I, what I try to help people. So I have a program that I teach at Emory University called Right to Know You, and it uses writing in the very same mechanic. And what I found is like there, people tend to be very, it's, it's ego. It, ego starts it all, right? Cause ego protects us from, from being silly. It used to protect us from getting eaten by dinosaurs. Now it kind of serves us in kind of a bad way. Right. But would you say like the first step in the process is kind of reduce, like reducing the ego enough to be willing to be silly, um, or playful, right? Is that the first step? Can I get into my first book? Have you guys seen this book called Play? No. no. Okay. So this changed me. So my therapist, <laughs> we're going to get right Let's into go. that. Let's go. Yeah. My therapist was like, um, I think I was working an agency job and, you know, there's just, there's pressures in that space. And I was also finding kind of new heights with the workshops that I was teaching. And I was just I'm like, I'm teaching people how to get in a flow and I'm teaching people about play, but I'm not like playing. I'm working all the time and I'm like, not okay. And my therapist was like, well, what is it that you need to do to actually prioritize this step one? Cause we know that's the first step is this like being willing to be wrong, being willing to be silly and knowing, cause I, at, at, at heart, still a strategist. I'm like, I need more information. So I sought out a book and I ended up with this book called Play, How It Shapes the Brain, Opens the Imagination and Invigorates the Soul. I ended up learning. Play is actually the way that um, animals and people build resilience. Because when you have something that is like low stakes that you can experiment with, it teaches you the muscle memory to get into that space that we were talking about earlier, where like all of a sudden you're like, wait, I'm starting to question what I'm doing. But if you're able to really commit to the bit and really be playful and silly and like lose all of the stuff ar around that, all of the expectations for a minute, that I think is absolutely key to getting into any creative process at all. And I will add in teams, this is really important and something that I think gets missed often. People are like, oh, we need innovation, we need creativity, and you need, <laughs> you literally need to be silly. Like wrong answers only, I think is the best way to start. With with play, I always think, does it have to does the playtime have to be linked to the task at hand? Or does play bleed mm. from other situations okay so so for my job i'm a writer this this week i've been writing about longevity and quantum computing and there's not much play in the the design and the writing but i play a lot i i play the guitar i go i spend a lot of my time snowboarding i do fun things with my kids does that playtime bleed through in terms of creativity or when so or or not can I build can I build up a play kind of battery that I can use in other domains and other roles? I think so. I think so. And I'll, I'll also add, I think play is really individual. So the thing is that on this journey of learning, learning about play and its role in the creative process, I've realized that my play might not be your play. So for me, I do need like a sketchbook and I have um I have some art that I do that I don't share that is literally just for me. And it's like, a, I have a series of absurd animals holding candy canes and it's like animals having treats, like the weirder combination, the better. And I do that just for me, just to goof off. Yeah. Cause I need that. Somebody else might not need that. And there's different, um, it's like another thing from this book, there's different types of, 
of play that people have. Some people are competitive players, some people are builders, some people are kind of imagination, like actors. And you kind of have to figure out how much of a battery boost each one of those things is for you over time. Because I think where we get in trouble is where we don't start scheduling it and we don't start prioritizing it. And then that gets to be a problem. I do think it's individual. Like for me, I need to have a context specific play. So I need to be having fun learning about like, what is like the weirdest, most absurd thing that Web3 did this week? Right. I just need that. I need the memes. Like I need something that will be fun for me before I get into, okay, now I got to sit down and like write some copy or create a, a plan. I think that's the best um, sentence I've ever heard on why Web3 <laughs> memes or memes are critical to, to, to the space. Thank you. Truly, it builds resilience. <laughs> like build, like, does, 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 uh, I, I kind of agree. Um, we almost communicate in GIFs and memes and they add that they're, they're, they're kind of getting ingrained into our community of culture. But with play, and I also think it trains flow because when you're young like play is your flow state like I, I have you can just watch my kids they're, they're, they're in flow and they don't have any other way to be in flow than other than via play so um yeah can we train our flow state by practicing more play jeremy might know this you like you must spend a lot of time in flow so i did i did a course on it a while back um there was uh i think jamie wheel and stephen kotler um came up with a course called the flow genome project. And, uh, it was like a three or four week thing. And, and it encouraged flow states through like breath cycles through one of the biggest things that was really cool is this harnessing uh, of vulnerability to, to generate, um, kind of insight. Right. And he asked all of us to reach out to three people and say, hey, what if you if you could advise me on one thing that I could do better to be the best version of myself, what would that be? And the responses I got back, this vulnerability exercise was amazing because, you know, uh, one one person said, well, hey, Jeremy, you're constantly late to most things that you do. You know, if you took other people's time more seriously, you know, you would have X, Y, Z results. And, and a lot of conversation, a lot of like recommendations like that. At first, I was like, you know. Duke's up, man. I'm, I'm never late. Like there's that, there's that ego protection thing, but it was a wonderful, uh, wonderful look into like how I structure things and getting the feedback loop. But yeah, flow is huge. Um, play is huge. I think the permission to play is, is the biggest problem. So a lot of people that listen to us lose, uh, work at companies are charged with, you know, leading massive teams are trying to figure out, uh, business and KPIs and all of that kind of stuff. So what could we do to advise them and say, hey, look, the industrial means of assessing productivity don't actually work as well as you think. We got to create space, right? So how do we how do we do it? Yeah. I mean, if you're just listening, I'll tell you, I have like the stupidest grin on my face because this is like my favorite question right now. Um, to that. So I actually about six months ago kind of came to the realization that this is needed in corporate environments and started to develop a corporate program because that is the problem that you run into. Like my background is on marketing teams, but I've never had a conversation with somebody where they did not have some version of these issues. And I think like to me, it kind of it, to oversimplify this, we can go back to that like maker manager schedule, giving people time to do deep work and telling them that it's OK to use that day for deep work. But I think it goes a little bit further and it is kind of um, can I'm going to get a little bit woo -woo with the language, but it's like a container holding issue for leadership. Right. Like you need to be able to say in this conversation and I, I, I will take on the responsibility as the leader of this team or of this call to ensure that I am maintaining emotional safety in the fact that this is a conversation that is going to stay in that brainstorming play space and that there are no wrong answers and that's what we're doing today. And then I will be equally clear 
when we're having a conversation that is an analytical conversation, where it is, it is, these are the KPIs, this is how we're measuring them, and this is how we're coming to our conclusions, and this is the framework that we're operating within. I think that we get so caught up in the day-to-day, -day, especially with the speed of tech, that it's really hard <laughs> to keep communicating that over and over, because it does feel like you're kind of stating something that might be obvious, but it's not. It's not obvious in the context switching world that we're in, mm -hmm. that if we're entering a conversation, the the space that that conversation is needs to be labeled and it needs to be labeled more than once in the conversation. So to your point, in terms of having the permission to play, there's a lot of ways that we could do that that are not part of our typical corporate culture and, or even like startup culture because in that space, it's like you're moving so fast, but you really have to do it. Just slow down enough to say you have this day for deep work or in this conversation as a team, we're operating from this more uh, creative space, like ideas welcome. And then in this other conversation, where the numbers are at the top of the hierarchy and this is what we're doing. Because once you start to actually like put a label on those, you remove a lot of the kind of like stress friction. What are people going to think about what I'm going to say? Is my idea the right thing to bring up? And then people start to feel a little bit more safe in actually stepping into that part of themselves. I think that's really powerful. I, I, I'm self-employed. I, I don't work in a big company. I don't have access to that many of those calls, but I see it and I I wonder how many people actually have their time labeled, this is what we're going to do, and how many, if they do, actually stay there, or just, it just seems that calls just go off on random tangents after about three seconds. So like, like how do you, like labeling it and saying it, then you, you're you allowed to rein it back in when it goes off. What One quick thought on that, Luz, this is like so serendipitous because you, you mentioned maker manager, you mentioned deep work. These are concepts that I use in the right to know you program to enable this like space creation. Right. And wow. I, I think it's, I think it's so important um, that, you know, that, that like creating that, like you walk into it, it's like a musician. So my, I'm a musician. So I think about it this way. I think about like, you know, you're in there rehearsing for a gig and you're like, all right, we got to get this breakdown. We got to get the song down versus, Hey guys, let's just screw around. Like Mark starts playing something. Hey, let's give ourselves permission to do something without expectation and call it that instead of being like, Hey, we're not doing our job right now. Right. I love the idea of calling yeah. it a space and, and letting people come in and out of it. It's brilliant. Well, and musicians have like language around that and culture around that, right? Like, hey, we should meet up and jam. When have you ever like met a musician who said that and then had an expectation that you would show up like in this very specific way? Like that's not, there's a, a very different way of approaching things that artists have that I think, um, dare I say, uh, is deeply, deeply needed where things are going when we take into account AI and the fact that like human creativity is going to become an even more important asset. And we just don't have those structures. Um, and I, I also am self-employed mostly and, you know, we'll work with bigger companies and kind of like swim through them. So I, I get this like peripheral perspective and, um, I find a lot of the time I have conversations with uh, the leadership side and they'll say things like, well, you know, it's just you come up with so many ideas and like, I'm just not sure why we're not getting that much from our, like our internal team. And I'm like, I can tell you why. <laughs> like, you don't give them a I safe space to do it, right? Yeah. <laughs> they don't have emotional safety. You don't have time and they don't they don't have um, you haven't delineated for them even if they have the time resources to do it. You haven't delineated for them that that's OK, because and a part that this whole conversation is surrounded by, we can't escape it, but there's a lot of social messaging around creative work and its value. And it's very bizarre. It's very bizarre. It's like the artist, the creative, the creator is this like magician, like priest, priestess on a mountaintop that emerges from like a, a cloud of smoke with a finished perfect product that only they have the capacity to develop. And it's this just like a magical thing that like unique to them. And it took no, no labor, it just emerged. 
And the analyst is this person who is always right, 100% critical, the data is everything. And the truth is that the reality is a lot more of a dance and it is like an iterative process on both sides. Do you know, I think that's, what part does AI play in this? Because I, I look, the idea of the, the, the creative being some distant mountain-based genius who comes up with this magic and th th that's one extreme. But the, the other, the AI has made it the other extreme where in fact they're just, it's almost nothing because an AI can do what they were doing to a whatever degree it is in a split second. So it's like the creator can't win. <laughs> quick, quick, quick shouts to Emma Jack joining us in from uh, from Kick. What's going on? Hope you're enjoying the conversation before we get down this AI rabbit hole. Uh, wow, that's a yeah, I've got so many thoughts on this, Luz. I'd love to hear where you're landing with this because um, yeah, it's not the easy button that everyone thinks it's going to be, right? Yeah. So I, I am actually really enjoying. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get weird with it. I'm gonna say I'm really enjoying my relationship to Chat GPT and to AI tools. I think that this is key. I, I've heard this said other places. It's not like my original concept, but I truly believe that what we are doing with these tools is a relationship to our own thinking. And that's very different than this like easy button concept, this idea that we're gonna like replace writers. Um, there's something that, and maybe this is like the idealist, like, you know, artsy poet in me, but I believe the winning of hearts is not something that you can automate. And the reason is because there's, um, not to get like too far down the like, you know, consciousness rabbit hole. But I do think that a, a thing in humanity is this way that we like move in this like, and I'm, I'm going to use the word esoteric, and I mean it in the mystical way. Uh, you know, it, we, we have this way of being connected to each other that moves and morphs. And it's not always something that gets like put in writing or gets documented somewhere or can be uploaded as a framework or a template to something. Um, so I don't actually think that there's going to be this, this point that we're going to come to where the artist gets removed from the equation. I do think it is it is a tool, and I, I think the people who will use the tool best are the people who develop the better relationship. And that might mean different things for different people, again, different types of play. For me, sometimes it's brainstorming, sometimes it's not the best way that I brainstorm. Sometimes it's, I want to like speak in a chat GPT, my messy ideas, and then say, okay, now I want you to like sort these and clean them up and like write them in the format of an email. It's it's a shortcut. Okay. You, you like shortcuts, Jeremy? You know, yes and no. Like I like I like short. But shortcuts are like you know how can I put non-essential? How can I batch non-essential things together uh, to save me time for the fun deep work? Right? You know how do you batch? You know it's this it's this it's this maker manager time which I think came out from a Paul Graham post Y Combinator like years ago. Uh, that, you know, as you structure your time in your day, you know, give yourself because your brain doesn't your your brain doesn't um, do deep work and administrative tasks in the same regard. You got to you got to cultivate. Like you said, you got to draw that bucket so you can jump in the fun stuff. Um, man, there's so much to unpack here. What? Let, let's go I, back I like to the hearts and minds. As yes. Well. Like, yeah, I love the um, you can't you can't win people's hearts with automation. Um, on the flip side of that, maybe you can win their minds, but that's a different. Oh, very interesting. Very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's the battle we're in. I think that's the battle we're in. What's the difference? There you're on the spot, Mark. <laughs> I thought that, that question was cute. Well, um, I, I, I suppose, like, I, I don't know, that the difference is the, is, the instantaneous here and now for something more deep and meaningful and lasting. I, I, I know I, I'd have to think about it, but maybe my initial thought is, yeah, that it's this battle between instant gratification and the now with something 
which lasts and resonates over time, maybe. One thought on that too, Luz, is, is, you know, hearts versus minds, right? So minds is the brains love shortcuts. Like it's, it's just how we operate, right? We want to be really efficient. You know, our brain wants to be really efficient, make decisions quickly. If we hear that snap twig behind us in the woods, we're going to turn around and run, right? Or whatever. It's all built into us. But, you know, um, to get out of the shortcut mode and break those patterns, um, that's where you get more meaningful relationships, I think. And, and that's where the heart piece of this thing comes in. Um, Follow-up question for you on that. How much do you think about the difference between uh, thought processes or thinking types like divergent thinking versus like convergent thinking? Like our schools teach us to be very good convergent thinkers. You know, you're on a conveyor belt of sorts. How difficult is it for people to activate divergent thinking? Because it's uncomfortable. It's hard to do, right? Um. Maybe I'm a good person to ask that question. Maybe I'm a terrible person to ask that question because I think about it constantly. And um, I will say I am ADHD and potentially, potentially ADHD. I'm not, you know, it's like to be determined. So this is just the way that I, divergent thinking is my norm. And I've had to like train myself to become a more like organized thinker especially in order to communicate in like professional settings and effectively as a teacher. Um, I do think that there is a way to facilitate that. And what I find is if you can, again, create an emotionally safe environment and think divergently with other people and start to kind of, it's almost like a, a popcorn effect. Like if somebody can start it, it starts to like, we ride each other's waves. And we can start to kind of get people to like come with us on a journey. And you can see the moment where that shifts. Because I think this thing where people are taught in school to think in this really like linear way shows up. It shows up as the guy who comes to like the painting workshop and is like, uh, like, I don't know what to do. And you start with a more structured approach when there's that fear or when there's that apprehension. So if you have a structured approach to getting unstructured and to starting to, to pull from different places, I think that actually creates a lot of emotional safety for people who are maybe not um, inherently a divergent thinker. That's been my personal experience, but maybe there's there's more to it than that. I think that's I think that's wonderful. It's like meeting yeah. someone where they are and, and speaking the language that they're speaking in. That resonates like, okay, you see me. You see who I am in my processes. I'm going to go on this walk with you because I feel a little more comfortable. And then they start to explore the the idea that, hey, it's okay to be silly. Um, the way I think about divergent thinking, the way I teach it and write to know you is that there's always like the paperclip test, right? You hold up a paperclip and like, hey, how many uses of this paperclip can you come up with? And it really is divergent thinking. Once you get past, it's hold, it holds papers together. Then you start thinking like of crazy things that, that are wonderfully... Uh, uh, catalyzed by divergent thinking, like, oh, it's a, it's a skewer for meatballs. It's a, a key to a door to the fifth dimension, like all of these fun things. And once you start doing that, it's easier to continue to do that, isn't it? I definitely think so. And I think it's similar to the play thing, there's a um, very personal, specific to you, specific to me, how you grew up, how I grew up, how we learned uh, needs around structure. And I think those are, again, like going back to what do we need in corporate environments to facilitate this stuff? I think we need to understand these things about each other. Mm -hmm. How much structure do you need? Do you need information in writing? Do you need instructions in writing and the goals in writing? Do you need to have a conversation like in order to really like push projects through? Um, like that to me is like the practical version of that is like, what is what level of structure does a specific engagement require? In your in your in your consulting world, when you get brought into organizations to kind of help, you know, catalyze creativity or innovation or you know whatever your whatever your kind of starting point might be, tell me about the most difficult, uh, the most the, the 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 organization or the person that you had the biggest challenge flipping that switch to show 
Hey, you know, there's creative in all of us. We just got to let loose. Like, how did you, how did you address it? And how, what was the outcome? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, how do I anonymize this? Um, yeah. So here's what I'll say. And I'll, 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 this is a little bit general and then I'll get into like the specifics. I think agency spaces are, um, a little more, um, I don't know, like subject to this tension because of incentives. So that's that's a difficult situation all on its own. Um, recently, I was like an interim head of Web3 for a marketing agency that was working on you know everything from like infrastructure to like NFTs to an exchange, like you name it. Um, and then part of the, this is like not a them issue. This is a agency like systemic issue. And part of it is you have conversations with the client about what their like needed outcomes are. And then you have internal processes that kind of by the nature of the agency, in order for you to be profitable, you have to have some sort of efficiency. And in order to develop efficiency, you have to have a framework and a process within which you work. And so you have to have the structure set up already. The problem comes when you have something that is not like a um, widget everybody knows, right? Like it's like e-commerce, if we're selling socks or whatever, like it, it, there's a framework that exists for this that we can use over and over and over again to tell stories that work for selling goofy socks or whatever. When we're talking about things that we have to like educate people on and then there's a culture around that and there's a community and then an ecosystem where there's a, a bridge that needs to be built. I think it's kind of hard um, to kind of break the, the mold of the framework without creating a ton of stress. And if you create a ton of interpersonal stress, then you can't be creative because people don't feel emotionally safe. Um, so that's that's the the problem in a nutshell that I've um, thought a lot about. And for me, the way kind of through, and this is this is like a personality thing, but I would come in and I would have like the silliest conversation that I could right off the bat with the team that I was working with. And so literally, it would be okay, we're working on this deliverable, we're under the clock, we've got all these things going on. And I would just like ask questions about like the joy in their lives. Because it's, there's no, there's no time, right? Like there's no time to like sit here and have like a really broad brainstorm when we have deliverables that are due in like X amount of days and we've got to like figure this out now. But what we can do is we can create some of that play space just by getting to know each other and like being humans with each other for like five minutes before we start to like dive into kind of like the messiness of the moment. And then whenever I would come back to these conversations where I'm, I'm essentially at, at that point, I was like the bridge between, you know, somebody who's doing like PPC or, you know, SEO or whatever, and they might be familiar broadly with the product, but not like deeply intimately aware of the product, like circumstances surrounding the product. And so I would have a proxy in my pocket because of these conversations where I could say, hey, like, you know, remember that TV show that we both watched and that, you know, one, that one joke that we keep talking about or whatever, here's like a way that we can like dance around this conversation where it's a little bit safer. So I, I had an awareness of the people that I was working with, what places they found joy in. And I've kind of made it my business to figure out how to use that as a lever to translate the more tense conversations that we were in. And I know that's like, not everybody's going to want to do that. That's like a very me thing. Like, but like joy at work is one of my core values. That's how I've approached that issue. I'm sure there are other ways. <laughs> I like that issue. I like that way to to deal with it. Um, or, or get them to let their guard down. And then I don't want to say the word like condition, but you kind of condition them for so that when things get difficult, you have a way to remove that barrier, which and that barrier is going to stimmy creativity and the solution to what you're trying to do. So I like that way of thinking about it. Um, do you mind, I'm aware of, of time here, that if we 
kind of pivot into um, digital art. I, what is a living provenance digital conceptual NFT, Luz? Um, so in order to answer that question, I need to tell you a little bit about my art process. Um, I work in layers. So I'll show you really quickly. And I know if you're if you're listening, you can't really see it, but I'll describe what I'm what I'm showing here. But basically, I create these paintings uh, that are abstract. They are not planned in any way, which means I'm in the moment intuitively responding to what's on the paper. Um, and on the back of these papers, as I sit down for a painting session, I will write down the date and the time. So this is something that um, I am working on trademarking, but it's called the Timescape Method. And essentially what I do is create a sort of visual time capsule with the work that I'm doing. Um, I've actually started a set of these here while we're talking. So I can kind of describe to you what that looks like. It's just a little piece of paper where I've drawn a squiggle and I've started to um, just put some watercolor on it. And I, I will let a layer dry. I'll go about my life. I will come back. And then rather than trying to create a design or create um, a specific structure, I will just respond to what's there immediately based on how I'm feeling in that moment. So what that looks like in a physical practice is I have loads and loads of papers that I'm working on at any given time. And then they start to come together on their own. And the thing that makes a cohesive collection is the fact that each of these pieces in a single grouping were worked on at the same time. And so that's how the work is made. That's the process part in a nutshell. Now, the concept behind that to me is something um, kind of retroactive, right? So I can see, for example, um, I've got some paintings that I worked on at the start of the pandemic. So when I found out that COVID was a thing, I realized that I was just gonna be home. And you know, we all had kind of our own ways of coping. And the way that I coped is I literally just sat down and just coated a bunch of small canvases in all black. I was like, I'm just going to paint a bunch of things. I, I, I have one thing of paint and I'm just going to use the one material and cover everything. Um, and I didn't know where it was going, what I was going to do with it. Right. Yeah. And then over, over time, I ended up adding one layer of one thing and then I would come back and use these as kind of like a meditative anchor. So what I have now, after years of doing that, is work that has almost like a, a physical uh, representation, a visual diary, um, including similar to like a photo has metadata. I now have metadata on these paintings through documentation, through tracking the time, date, sometimes location. And... I think that's actually very similar and follow me down the rabbit hole for, for a second. That's very similar to how we interact online. Um, I am not always, even though I'm coming from a social media background and I'm coming from an analytical background as a marketer, I'm not always thinking about like what I'm clicking on, how that's building up a data profile of me somewhere. Like that picture is not always in my head and yet it's happening. Like it's being collected. There's an image of me somewhere on each platform that I interact with. And I'm basically able now, because I've been on the internet for however many years, I can look back and I can see my digital footprint. And that's an image of me in a sense. And the same is true for any like brand or concept or thing you look up. Over time, it starts to kind of like build its own image. And there's not... I don't personally plan that as deeply as a lot of people do. I think you can. I think there are degrees. But the interesting thing to me, the interesting concept behind this is how do things change and how are they different when things are very intensely 
documented. So for example, I have, I have these pieces which I travel with. So if I flip them over, you'll see which direction the paper was facing when I was working on it. And you'll see where I was and you'll see um, the time, the date, and I can look back at other things going on in my life and I can pull images and create a thorough story of how something came together. And then I have work that I create that I document very little. So the concept that I'm exploring is not just like our relationship to time, but a relationship to interacting with the outside world in, from a place of response and the way that that compounds and develops things that we haven't planned. So that's the concept behind the physical part of the wow. work. Um, one, one quick follow, one quick follow on before you dive yeah. further into the, the, the tech side of it is the super, super interesting. Like I, I'm trying to kind of coalesce all the things I'm thinking about asking you, but one, one thing that's super interesting, did it, did it make it easier to participate in that experience when you are making it just one thing you're reacting to instead of having to have this blank page thing where, hey, I'm making something amazing today. It's going to be huge where you're just like, hey, here's this little layer and I'm just going to react to that layer. A, did that make it easier? And B, did you have time constraints to your little uh, interaction sessions? Um, that's one of the, that's one of the variables. Um, if, um, we can think about it, I'm going to come at this from like, a it's physical art, but pretend it's generative art. If one of the components and one of the variables that's in the mix is the amount of time per session or the physical location or the size of paper that I'm able to carry around, all of these things are kind of part of the soup that make like a little collection individual. Um, so I guess, I guess the answer is yes. And it, uh, yeah, just like it depends. So I've got work that is huge, as tall as me. I've got work that's small and the amount of time that I spend on each one, I don't super plan it, but it, it just is like an outcome of, you know, circumstances. Obviously if I'm traveling, I don't have as much time. Um, and the, the way that I choose the materials, I think is pretty important too, because that's literally, I will come into my studio and be like, what am, it's like fully somatic intuitive experience. Like, what am I drawn to right now? Like what feels like it's going to like scratch the itch to me. That's, that's like another aspect that's interesting because we don't really get to do that very much in existence as adults in 2023 like it, there's not a lot of places where you can only do exactly what you're just physically feeling like doing um and i like to see that compounded as well really important takeaway for those folks that are listening that don't think that that they have that narrative that keeps hitting i'm not creative you know i'd you know i, I could never be a writer i'm not a painter i'm not an artist you know that you know making time for these little experiments holding space to play is very applicable in everything we do and it's innate to who we are right as 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 human beings and um i think businesses would be really a lot better off and achieving way more than they think they could achieve by incorporating exactly what Luz is talking about here so i just wanted to i just wanted to stamp that uh as 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 we were talking through i think it's really important thank you for that i i also feel like in these, when, when I'm in the frustration of this tension of what the system is and what I see as possible from an artist perspective, I always think like, boy, would it be so much more efficient? <laughs> you know, like, we would have so much more efficiency and therefore like, it is like, I'm coming at it from like a very like capitalistic interest too. Like I, I really think that um, we get a lot out of operating from from that place. So what are the keys to transitioning in and out of those worlds, right? Where you're, where you're able to play, but like my grandfather used to say, you know, this lesson is, is, you know, land the damn plane already. Right. So we've been playing around, you know, when can we bring that idea mm -hmm. down to tangible, uh, the world of KPIs, the world of revenue returns the, you know, how do we, how do we balance that, yeah. uh, that back and forth? 
Yeah, so I, I think one of the keys that we have already touched on is this idea of the maker manager conversation. But I think a step further than having a maker manager schedule is we, we need to ground our conversations and our intentions. So we need to have intentionality around the container that we're in. And that is like a, a practice. And, and that is the, the most practical way, I think, in groups to do this is to develop that communication muscle and to be willing to repeat ourselves until it becomes a habit. Um, and that's like the labeling piece. Um, and then beyond that, I think we need to learn a lot about ourselves that we were not allowed to learn because we were taught how structure is supposed to be and how the workday is supposed to look in this like very, you know, first you do this, then you do this, then you do this way. In order to combat that, there's a little bit of like self-discovery that needs to happen. And I think people can do it in anything creative that they love, right? Like it could be cooking, it could be gardening, it could be clay or any side thing where you could explore it even at work. Although I think that's a little bit harder because there's attachments that we have to those concepts. Um, but it's really understanding kind of like your own personal language around creating, not just from what you imagine to be creative, but just literally making anything happen. Like, what do you literally need? Do you need things to be written down? Do you need to um, have like a little friendly competition? Like, what are the, the building blocks of your kind of creative persona? We don't really understand that about ourselves unless we are people who are dedicated to a craft for many, many years. And a lot of people don't have that privilege. And so I think creating spaces where people can explore that and where it's okay to have those conversations is really, really important. To me, the practical is communicating the need and communicating the, the cognitive space that we're in together so that we're using the same lever together. I like that. Um, sorry, my, my uh, I, I have to close the loop on your art. I have to go back to it. Yes. Because, <laughs> um, so you have your, your, your piece of art with all of your personal metadata on it when it was taken, which angle is that, how long you spent on it, where you were. Then what happens? Mm -hmm. So I will take the work I'll show that work this piece behind me. Um, I did um, for a museum exhibit uh, in 2022. So uh, metaphorically, we're, we're just gonna point to this one, but if you, if you purchase a work, what I will do is I will then take all of the metadata that exists and weave it into a story. So the format for you know, if you want to like, know the explicit like NFT details, the format is there's an NFT of the image, but then behind the image are unlockable files that are the literal inception to completion of that story from every point of documentation that I have. And each collection has a different amount of information that goes in there. So that may be like video, it may be writing, it may be like photos of what was going on in the world. And my, my vision for this is to show physical work next to multimedia, showing you the progression of what it takes to make something. Because some of these pieces I've been carrying around for years. Like I've had 10 year pieces where I've been developing this relationship for 10 years. And to me, when I was thinking about what I see NFTs as and what I see, I mean, I feel like now everything, we're, we're wanting to put everything on chain. But the concept of putting something on a digital ledger forever really struck me as an artist. And although I was aware of NFTs before 2021, I didn't want to just like mint a JPEG. I wanted it to fit with the concept. And so the way that this is fitting for me now is um, to make that moment of minting the physical piece part of the relationship that I have, not just with that collector, but with the collection of work. And then that allows me in the future, when a motif comes back around, because they always do, because I'm just a person, so I, I will repeat patterns or I will repeat things that start to look similar. I can then airdrop that person, the piece that maybe is like the cousin to the piece that they already had, and then start to build sort of a network of, um, 
motifs and language that um, gets built through abstract painting. Super cool. Wow. It's, it's, and there's so many parallels to the other worlds that you live in through this. Like art is one of the, one of the cool ways that you can see um, how something is just not, you know, the artist goes up to the mountaintop and like some magic happens. And then the artist walks back down with this finished piece. Like you're unlocking the, the, the process and the steps to what it takes to capture something creatively and where your inspiration was and where your head was and what inspired. Yeah. Like all of those things, but you're opening it up to people as this process of creativity rather than a finished product. And I think that can apply to the things in technology that we think about the things in business that we think about the things in science that we think about, like how they're not just finished goods. There's a whole meaning and story uh, that's important that we can learn from as well. Brilliant. I love it. And it, it's, it's fantastic. Ties into the book club nicely, Jamie, doesn't it? Oh with, my with, gosh. With, with uh, exactly what we we're talking about with, was it Edison and the light bulb being this universal symbol of like uh, a creative idea. It took like a thousand iterations over like many years to get to that idea, which is actually not spontaneous at all. Um, and the process is, the pro it's all about the process. It's the journey, not the finished article, isn't it? It's, and now like NFTs and this blockchain gives us the, gives artists the tools to, to document that. Uh, it's pretty powerful. Agreed. And, you know, to be, to be mindful of time, uh, I want to, I want to try and, uh, try and, you know, close a loop on this conversation, but I think this is one of the most powerful ones and meaningful ones. I think we've had this year just related to like how things come about and giving yourself permission to making things and giving yourself permission to having those things be iterative and generate meaning down the road and being able to be playful and do things without expectation. And like, these are such big themes that, um, that a lot of people don't allow themselves to participate in. And I think they, I think if they do, they'll find major things unlocked. So Luz, this has been an amazing conversation. I look forward to staying in touch and uh, learning more about the stuff that you do, checking out your art. I'm sure we'll get links together and Mark will post, but um, thank you for a wonderful discussion today. Yeah, it's been an almost serendipitous summary, bookend of all of the people we've spoken to, like, as Jeremy mentioned, those very things of the playful, make mistakes, the iteration process. And I think almost without question, all of our guests have had that in their current lives to some degree. So this is a really kind of awesome way to bring it all together. Thank you. Thank you both. This has been so much fun. Awesome. And uh, just to just to wrap up a couple things, um, another thank you to uh, our amazing sponsor, Ripple, W-R-I-P-P-L-E, marketing's on-demand talent platform, stacking teams for big companies, uh, innovating from the outside in. Uh, they're a great group to lean on. Uh, if you need stuff like this, they've got great yeah. people in there that, that, that you can find and, and apply to projects. Um, and then also, we have a book club for crying out loud. Like, we're reading books together. We're synthesizing ideas together. We're doing it in quasi real time. Mark and I, if you sign up uh, thinking on paper.xyz slash book club, you'll get a chapter breakdown of Julio Atino's great book, The Nexus, which is is starting to weave into all of our discussions amazingly. And then Mark, tell us where we're headed with the book club. What are we doing? Well, uh, on a very broad level, we're reading books and then talking about it together as a community where, where we can kind of synergize and understand, have fun with the ideas. I think anytime you read a chapter from a book, you look at it, you think about it in a different way to somebody else and having their opinions, their ideas about it helps you to expand what you're thinking. I think just there, we, we've spoken about thinking on paper to X, Y, Z. Luz, where can our listeners see your work? Where can they... Uh, follow your your journey with your nfts and your teaching and everything. yeah so if you oh yeah so all, all the things all the places so my website is lusedonahue.com there you will find art upcoming workshops i'm doing one in january for intention setting using abstract painting and you can learn this method if you would like to get to know me more personally on tiktok i am just unhinged and Basically, any socials that you're on, you can just type in my name, Farcaster, Instagram, all the things. 
I will say I made this little guy while we were chatting. So that's what that looks like with three layers. And um, I'm gonna finish him up and then gift him to the listeners. So we'll have a little NFT moment. Awesome. To close out the season. That's Wonderfully <laughs> kind of you, Luz. Thank you yes. so much. Real-time art creation and distribution. Uh, awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, uh, listeners and audience. Uh, thanks for listening to Thinking on Paper. Thanks for making this show so special um, to to Mark and I. And and um, you know, like I like Mark said earlier, he's super proud. I'm super proud of what we're what we're building, and I'm thankful that uh, you guys are out there listening. So yeah. um, keep thinking on paper, guys. See keep thinking time. on paper. Love it. Bye bye. I gotta get in on the book club. <laughs>